I'm Ali Fimova. I'm Terry Cohn. Well, welcome to the sixth and final episode of our video blog on Sonia Rappaport's conceptual project, Objects on My Dresser. Between 1979 and 1983, as she mourned her mother's recent death, Rappaport collaborated with a psychologist to analyze and interpret the personal significance of mementos and souvenirs that accumulated on her bedroom dresser at Tansu. The project unfolded over five years in what Rappaport called phases or iterations, which we now documented and researched for an upcoming book. You can find more about the entire project as well as access previous episodes of the video blog on the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust website. In the previous episodes, we spoke with our guests about a number of aspects of um, objects on my dresser, including its intersection with science, its unique poetics, um, a play with image word object associations, its pioneering turn to coding and data visual visualization. Today, we want to think about the iterations of the project where Rappaport first turned to gallery installations and then engaged her audience in producing the work in uh, a series of participatory performances. One of the first installations, Psychoesthetic Dynamics, took place at 80 Langton Street in 1980, later New Langton Arts, it, a famed alternative artist-run space in San Francisco where Rappaport's installation filled the gallery. The installation was significant as it was the first time Rappaport juxtaposed her tonsu dresser topped with 28 personal mementos with the NetWeb, a radial spiderweb plot projected onto the gallery floor, a visual representation of data collected in the process of psychoanalysis, a web of associations between objects and images, words and symbols, a coded map of the artist's psyche. Cards with images of objects and images and words correlated to the objects were placed on various points on the net web axes. Gallery visitors were invited to view the installation which also included wall-mounted images of the object and word cards while listening to audio tape discussions between Rappaport and psychotherapist Winnip Britt Boss projected into the space. The phase emerged from extensive discussions with DeVos about Rappaport's associations with her own object word selections, which resulted in idiosyncratic categories, threading, masking, moving, hand, chest, and eye. Well, last week, we had the pleasure of speaking with Renny Pritikin, who was one of the founders of A.T. Langton in the middle of 1970s. And then he became co-director and a director of the space until 1992. Subsequently, Pritikin served as a curator at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, the Nelson Gallery and Fine Arts Collection at UC Davis, and until recently at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. Let us start by, by asking you uh, about the history of A.T. Langton Street and its role in, in um, uh, sort of that, that the art life of San Francisco in the 1980s and especially in terms of performance art. Yeah, actually uh, Langton opened in 1975 uh, and it was part, uh, it's important to see it in context uh, that it was not part of, it was not a sole unique uh, event. It was part of a national movement um, tied up with all the social conflict and complexity of the, of the time, uh, especially the having opened in 75, uh, the Vietnam War ended in 73. So it has to be seen in the, in the context of a sweeping national alienation by young artists, young people and young artists uh, setting up alternative venues in every conceivable way. There were a lot of artists doing performance, installation, video, 
and other experimental and interdisciplinary forms. And no, it's very hard to believe in 2020 that uh, that no museum and virtually no uh, gallery existed to support this kind of work. It was out of the question for SF MoMA, certainly, uh, or any other institution. The idea was that uh, we would show non-commercial work, work in new genres. Um, the ethos of this movement that we were part of was that artists should be on the board of directors. Uh, all Langton was militant about it and it was all artists on the board of directors, um, that artists had control over the presentation of their work and that artists had to be paid. And throughout the history of Langton, while I was there, 50% uh, of the budget would go to artists' fees. The idea was to support these new forms that uh, were not being supported elsewhere. And also, uh, you know, we didn't use terms like equity back then, but uh, they're definitely was an understanding of uh, feminist critique of the uh, art world. And so there was a, a commitment to equal participation of women. What do you remember about Sonia's work? Since she was shown there in 1980, um, we're interested to hear your memories or reflections on um, what that project was like. She put in a proposal and um, uh, you know, she used all the right words to get our interest. And as a woman, uh, it was uh, doing installation work. It was uh, certainly not market-oriented work. It was it was uh, definitely in the conceptual tradition. We were doing so many installations and performances in this space. And um, who were the other artists who were doing this? Maybe some. A similar kind of work in terms of yeah that's a good question yeah. Uh, yeah excuse me i'm sorry I'll... the context yeah there was a woman named claudia de monte who had uh, some success at the time that we showed uh, where she um put a hundred photographs of herself on the wall and uh invited the public to take one if they put up one. So uh, that kind of exchange. So I, I think that was in the um, uh, tradition of, of what uh, Sonia was doing. And, and I also think uh, things like um, Howard Freed's All My Blue Clothes. I don't know if you know that work where he uh, literally took all his blue jeans and work shirts and stuffed them into the intersection where the floor and the ceiling met at the Berkeley Art Museum, um, where the uh, the personal becomes political. Mm -hmm. One of the people who was very important in the conceptualization and the program at Langton was uh, the feminist theorist uh, Constance Penley, who teaches at UC Santa Barbara now, I think. Um, but she was quite brilliant and, and definitely, uh, she was the founder, one of the founders of Camera Obscura, a feminist Marxist uh, journal, film journal <laughs> that was heavily Freudian. So um, I don't recall at all if Connie was at the curatorial meeting, uh, um, but she influenced our thinking uh, certainly my thinking and Judy's thinking. And, and so uh, Sonia's um, reference to Freudian and uh, psychoanalysis, I think might have rung a bell with us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rennie, for um, joining us again. And we really appreciate your time and your insights and your recollections and um, your willingness to help us wrap up this video blog on objects on my dresser. So now we're moving forward with putting together a book about the project and we'll be certain to credit you and stay well. It's enlightening to have Rennie Pritikin's recollections of the first installation phase of objects on my dresser and 80 Langton Street. It provides insights into the cultural milieu 
of that time. Rappaport started the project by analyzing, mapping, coding, and interpreting her own psychic space based on her deeply personal associations. A few months later, she launched a series of participatory performances where she asked gallery visitors to create their own word, image, object associations, turning their responses into new sets of data to analyze. The first of these was shared dynamics, which included cards with images of correlative objects related to the objects on Rappaport's tonsu that gallery visitors were invited to choose and place on the radial plot. It was performed several times in such New York venues as Artist Space, New School for Social Research, and Sarah Lawrence College. Rappaport used the data gathered from audience responses in shared dynamics to create the next round of participatory performances. For instance, in 1982, she created the Object Connection, a window installation in San Francisco that made use of responses from various participants gathered in shared dynamics. The respondents' reasons for selecting and placing the image on a particular axis was broadcast into the street from an audio recording. Rappaport also invited passersby to engage in this activity by submitting a response in an adjacent mailbox. The final iteration of the Objects on My Dresser participatory performances, the transitive property of equality, took place posthumously at Crowsword Gallery in Oakland in 2015. That final phase of Objects on My Dresser, realized nearly four decades after Rappaport started the project, was the subject of our first blog in this series. And um, now we're concluding this blog and um, turning to our work on the first monograph about this foundational project in the history of feminist conceptual art. We're grateful to all the colleagues and friends who talked to us over the last few months and we particularly appreciate the support of Farley Gwazda, director of the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust, and value his dedication to advancing Rappaport's artistic legacy.